All right. Uh, I'm just going to leave the sidebar up there. I don't want to take any more time. Um, but sorry. Okay. So hi, my name is Tom Alphon. Um I'm today. I'm going to talk to you about a little project that I've been working on for the last few months. Uh, it's a, uh, a project I call Tensil. Uh, its goal is to implement TensorFlow models directly in silicon uh, to achieve performance gains. Um, so before I tell you more about this project, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, uh, I did my undergrad studies at MIT. Um, I studied maths and physics. For the last few years, I've been working as a software engineer here in the SF Bay Area. Um, I've had an interest in machine learning uh, for a long time, and in the last year or so, I've become more interested in the neural network accelerator hardware space, uh, which has exploded in recent years, as I'm sure you're all very aware. Um, and so, for the last few months, I've been working on this project. Um, uh, it's based on an idea that's been kicking around in my head for a while, but I, I wanted to explore what was possible. Uh, and I was very excited to find out about Chisel and, and realize that this, this project was, uh, you know, maybe feasible. So, um, so it began with a question. Uh, the question is, what, is the li what are the limits to our ability to implement neural networks in hardware today? Uh, and looking at the uh, neural network accelerator field, it seems like uh, most of the new hardware architectures that are coming out are aimed at solving the problem of memory access, putting memory in the right place at the right time uh, to enable faster processing. Um, so uh, my question was, uh, what are the limits of this, uh, of, of how far we can go in solving this problem? Um, so to answer that question, um, uh, I, you know, I, I began my research uh, uh, reading studies uh, like this one that came out of MIT a few years ago uh, about how memory access is the bottleneck made me realize that maybe the best way around this problem is actually just to try and eliminate as much memory access as possible. Um, so in thinking about that, I, I was thinking about what kind of workloads I would, uh, you know, we're trying to target. Um, so for example, uh, one of the most important workloads that people are thinking about is the autonomous vehicle vision stack uh, kind of workload. Uh, so what's going on there is that you'll have uh, a vision stack that needs to do things like recognize objects, um, and uh, in doing this, you'll, you know, if, if you're building an autonomous vehicle, you're almost certainly going to be using a convolutional neural network. But furthermore, you're almost certainly going to be using one of a very small number of, of extremely optimized pre-trained networks that came out of, uh, you know, universities and big research labs. These are networks like ResNet and VGG, AlexNet. Uh, everyone's using the same models, but furthermore, everyone's using the exact same uh, static, predetermined workloads, the same weights. Um, so this got me thinking, uh, you know, um, so what is the purpose of, of memory? Uh, um, why do we need these memory accesses at all? Uh, memory is for flexibility. It enables you to implement different uh, operations given the same uh, machinery. Uh, but a huge amount of the workload that we're trying to solve here is actually completely predetermined. We don't need to implement different operations. We just want to implement the same, uh, the same operation, the, you know, these huge, uh, complicated, convolutional uh, operations as fast as we possibly can. Uh, so can we trade off this flexibility in order to gain performance and efficiency? So um, I began working on this project, Tensil. I think of it as a compiler for taking TensorFlow model descriptions and, uh, you know, through Chisel, uh, generating RTL that implements them in a huge block of combinational logic. Um, so how does this process work? Uh, we start with, uh, oh, so it's a four-stage pipeline. We start with the TensorFlow graph description. So in TensorFlow, uh, 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 computations are represented as a graph. Each node in the graph is a computational operation. Um, so each node will have an operation type. That will be like a matrix multiplication, a convolution, a reshape operation, uh, things like that. Uh, then each node can also have, uh, you know, a customizable data type, um, and then various different constant parameters that will configure the operation. So this is things like the size of, uh, of the filter in a convolution or something like that. Um, and then finally, the node, uh, each node obviously, yeah, obviously needs to specify its inputs. Okay, so given that graph description, uh, Tensil will uh, first run a preprocessor step over the graph to try and groom the graph to make it more amenable to, uh, to RTL generation. Um, one example of this is uh, in TensorFlow, the flatten operation, which essentially unrolls uh, a matrix into a, into a big long vector, um, is implemented in a, in a bunch of small operations, but it's actually really easy to just implement that in hardware in one, uh, one kind of 
step. Uh, so, so the preprocessor will, will merge those, uh, that string of operations together. Um, uh, then the next uh, stage in the pipeline is the module creator. Um, this essentially, this is pretty simple. It just chooses which uh, module out of a, a library of, uh, of modules that, that I wrote. Um, uh, it chooses which ones, uh, which module should be instantiated in order to satisfy this computational operation requirement. Uh, uh, it'll then derive the, uh, the module's arguments. So these would be the parameters, you know, to the generator. Um, things like the shapes of the input tensors, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, it'll also use the, uh, the module's input modules in order to derive those attributes. Finally, it'll instantiate the module, which then configures itself given the set of inputs, uh, and then connect up the inputs. Um, connect up the, uh, the input nodes to the computation. And then finally, chisel takes over, RTL gets generated, and we have a chip. Uh, at the heart of this process is the uh, tensor data type, um, which is uh, essentially analogous to other sort of uh, matri uh, matrix data types in other languages and frameworks for you know, linear algebra or machine learning. Um, so it provides all the kind of facilities you'd expect, which makes expressing these um, these operations really straightforward. Um, so, you know, you can do things, so a, a tensor is defined by its shape and its data type. You can do things like slice the tensor. Um, you can obviously retrieve, um, uh, retrieve data by index. Um, you can map over a tensor. You can connect tensors together, do basic arithmetic on them. You can kind of do a whole bunch of um, uh, normal stuff that you would need to do in machine learning uh, kind of without breaking your stride here, and, and it's all going to be synthesizable. Um, so it, it, it avoids the need to work with a bunch of low-level indices and lose track of what's going on. Uh, you can think at a much higher level, which is what Chisel is for. Um, so here's an example of one of the modules. This is kind of one of the simplest modules you could think of. It's just a matrix multiplication. Um, so the convolution looks a little bit more compl complicated than this, but um, this is a good place to, uh, to th look at what, what's going on. Um, so you can see that uh, this module uh, accepts uh, its accepts two shapes as, a, as an input. Those are the shapes of the input tensors. So this is a matrix multiplication, matrix A times matrix B. So we have the shape of A and the shape of B. Uh, the IO to the module is defined in terms of these tensors. So every module can have one or more tensor inputs, uh, but must have one tensor output. Um, so, uh, so then the implementation of the actual matrix multiplication is really easy to express in terms of tensors. You can see here it's about four lines of code. Um, and uh, and uh, it's just it's just a straightforward inner product like you would read out of a you know machine learning paper or something. Uh, and then finally, arithmetic operations in Tensile abstract over the uh, uh, over several chiseled data types just to add some, some more generic capabilities. Um, so uh, you know what does this actually get us? Um, this is uh, the result of compiling a two by three by three by two. 16-bit fixed-point matrix multiplication, um, so 95 lines of Verilog, you know, uh, it's nice. And the best part is that it works, uh, which we can test using Chisel's unit testing facilities, um, which is, you know, which is a really great feature to have. Um, okay, so taking this idea further, like, can we synthesize this uh, and then hopefully, you know, maybe fabricate it? Um, so I did some uh, experiments with synthesizing with a, with a synthesis flow. Um, so my flow is, you know, first generate uh, a given module uh, with tensile and chisel, then uh, use Yosis and ABC to synthesize and optimize the resulting RTL, uh, and then check out the statistics um, and see what I get at the end. Just to get a sense of like how, you know, how huge of a combinational logic block are we talking about here? Is this something that you could realistically uh, use? And uh, one thing to note is that the, um, the number of logic levels is, uh, is relatively flat across different sizes of uh, matrix multipliers and convolutions. Um, and so uh, I wasn't able to synthesize larger uh, convolutions uh, because uh, both Fertile and ABC uh, had a lot of trouble dealing with the huge combinational logic blocks. Um, and so that's one thing that I want to uh, work on in the future to try and um, uh, enable me to continue this experimentation. But um, even, even just with what we've got here, you can see that the number of logic levels is relatively flat across the convolution and uh, input sizes. And so if you assume that, um, you know, scaling up to the larger 
uh, convolutions, which are about 10 times larger than this, uh, gets you the same number of logic levels, then you might then, you know, potentially, uh, we might be looking at about, um, you know, four microseconds for one inference across an entire network like uh, ResNet 50, um, which is really fast compared to what can be done today. Um, obviously, you know, we're not, this is a completely fixed, inflexible uh, chip. It can't implement any other models, but it can implement this model potentially two orders of magnitude faster than uh, existing state-of-the-art compute hardware. Um, so, uh, one other thing to note is that um, doubling the uh, input dimensions in the convolution requires about uh, 4.6 times as many gates. Uh, and so, scaling this up to some of the largest convolutional layers we might expect to ever want to use, um, which are the, uh, the input layers in a, in a big model like VGG16, um, then we'd be looking at about 320 million gates in the input layer. That's a lot of gates. Um, that's the biggest layer in the, in the network. But um, what, that work, what that kind of works out to is these chips, if, synthesize, if we synthesized an entire uh, model, would be, you know, would require several billion gates, um, which is a lot, and it's ambitious, but it is possible. Uh, you know, chips this large are being built right now, uh, and the, you know, certainly this is not gonna be economical, but I have hopes that, um, but bear in mind that this uh, technique hasn't so far, I haven't used any kind of compression or quantization or, um, you know, memory reduction techniques whatsoever in, in doing this. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential there to get the gate count uh, significantly further down, uh, which would make uh, synthesizing this stuff, you know, a lot more feasible. Um, but it's, it's possible today if you wanna spend a lot of money. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, I've only really just started this project. It's been going for a few months, um, uh, and it's a side project for me, so there's a lot that I still want to do. Um, uh, first, I obviously need to study the power dissipation characteristics of this uh, to get a sense of how this uh, shakes out from a power efficiency point of view. I'm very optimistic that these, the, the results there would be um, promising, uh, you know, given that, the, again, we've eliminated a whole class of operations, the memory accesses. Um, uh, second, uh, like I mentioned, um, there are some limiting kind of steps in the design tool uh, flow right now, which I'm hoping to, uh, to work on and, and try and uh, understand what the limits are there. It seems to me that certain, uh, you know, optimization passes in various tools haven't really, like, considered just such huge blocks of combinational logic, and so I need to think about maybe eliminating those passes or reworking them uh, to make this possible. Um, then I would like to eliminate Verilog entirely from my workflow. Um, as a software person, I don't know Verilog very well at all, and I don't really want to, to be honest. Um, and, so, <laughs> and so if I can get rid of it, that would be great. I mean, Fertile is awesome, um, and Chisel emits Fertile, and if, if I can get the synthesis tools to accept Fertile, then, uh, you know, then I don't need Verilog at all. Um, uh, finally, like I mentioned on the previous slide, um, I would like to investigate uh, quantization, uh, network compression, uh, and other memory reduction techniques that are very sort of uh, well studied in the, in the machine learning literature um, and in the hardware world as well in order to reduce that gate count and make this a lot more economical. And then last, um, uh, this is a, a conjecture, but I believe there are opportunities here to understand, um, uh, to study the, study, use verification methods to study uh, how to improve fabrication uh, yields by taking advantage of the robustness properties of neural networks. Um, neural networks are robust to noise. Uh, they, can, they can handle it when some parts don't work quite the way you'd expect, which maybe means that we can improve fabrication yields, uh, you know, reduce losses due to fabrication errors. Uh, so this work wouldn't be possible uh, without Chisel, so thanks to the developers um, and the community for providing such a great tool. Um, and yeah, I'll open it up to questions now. Thank you. So, uh, while we're setting up, I think we have time for one quick question. All right. Thank uh, you very much. I have, hold on. Oh, I'll you give you oh, one. sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, do you think it's easy for people to extend uh, your model with their own node types as if they're developing new uh, networks that they want to try out with your scheme? Um, is it, sorry, is the question? It's, do you it, like it's, a new node type in TensorFlow, how much, how difficult is that for you to add? Oh, it's it's very simple. Yeah, this is why I, I sort of I spent a lot of time working on the tensor data type and then uh, implementing the matrix multipliers. You can see is very easy. The convolution is only a little bit more complicated, um, and new node types are very straightforward. Um, in fact, I often find myself, uh, you know, 
uh, as I'm writing a module, I'll realize, oh, I could actually do this a lot uh, more simply if I just were a little smarter with how I'm using this data type that I've written for myself. So um, I pretty much, you can read, you know, you can read a machine learning paper and basically like almost verbatim copy it uh, and get a hardware module, which I think is kind of cool. Awesome. Let's thank our speaker again. Thanks very much. Thank